but I was inspired by the mine workers because mm. I lived quite close to a hostel which housed migrant workers who were coming from different parts mm. of South Africa and over the weekends they would perform their own traditional forms mm. and at home we had a very small television screen mm. and Michael Jackson would pop mm. and I thought hmm that's interesting Gregory Vuyani Magoma is more than just a dancer. He's an all-round creative that has built himself a formidable resume that shows off his talents as a creative director, choreographer, producer, and of course, dancer. Thank you so much for joining us, Greg. We're Thank very you. excited for this following, this coming weekend. Yes. Um, if you can just tell us about what's in store for this weekend for, for GM50. <laughs> so GM50 Legacy is all about ensuring that everyone is catered for. Mm -hmm. From the children, to young adults, to adults, to grannies, to daddies, to grandfathers, everyone is catered for. And I was thinking about how do I want to celebrate my 50 years? And I thought about the legacy projects. So I've chosen very specifically projects that speak to legacy. Mm. And on top of it, I'm also uh, published two books. Wow. Yeah, so I'm an author of nice. two books. So yeah, it's there's, it's there's everything for everyone from literature to dance to music. Lovely. And I believe you're also looking, you're, you're almost at retirement now. Yeah. So what does retirement mean for you? Is it retirement just from dancing, from choreography? What, where are you in and where are you out? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in a process of retiring yeah. from being on stage. Mm. And I've always said that I want to retire when I'm at my peak. Mm. So I am absolutely at my peak. Yes. And I feel it's the right time for me to, to hang up my shoes and to give myself time and space mm. to do other things that I've always wanted to do, mm. more into mentorship, more into writing, more into directing and choreography. Mm. And where does the Vianney Dance Theatre fit into all of that? Well, Vianney is my baby, yeah. you know, uh, it will always be my baby and um, it's part of that legacy. I've always wanted to create a company that will live long after me. Mm. And we are achieving that with the company that it can tour by itself, mm. that I don't have to be there. And that's incredible to see. Mm. But I think now a bigger responsibility is to create an amazing space that our, every child mm. can walk into and feel inspired. Mm. If you can just let us know what the history behind your love affair with dance. How did it start? How long has it been? Who has inspired you? Uh, I think I was born a dancer. Yes. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's a saying in our, in, in, in our African um, Indian idioms that there's always a dancer in ourselves. Mm -hmm. There's because there's a heartbeat. It's mm -hmm. there. It's always, it's always dancing. But you are born with your mother going to the river and they singing and they, mm -hmm. they dancing. When they put you to sleep, there's always movement. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you're already there. But I was inspired by the mine workers because mm -hmm. I lived quite close to a hostel which housed migrant workers who were coming from different mm -hmm. parts of South Africa. And over the weekends, they would perform their own traditional forms. Mm -hmm. And at home, we had a very small television screen mm -hmm. and Michael Jackson would pop. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And I started fusing the, uh, the traditional movement with the pop culture. Mm -hmm. And um, you spoke about Vuyani Dance Theatre being your baby and mentoring young dancers. Um, how do you source the dancers? Can they come uh, audition for you? How does that process work? Well, it happens two ways. There are times when we are in need of dancers mm -hmm. and we call, we, we do an audition call. Mm -hmm. But many a times dancers walk in mm -hmm. and, you know, people walk in and it, at, 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 at times it's the right moment. Mm -hmm. And we, they, they arrive at a time when there is a need mm -hmm. or there is space and we are able to, to, to take them. But it's an audition process mm -hmm. that we usually use. Mm -hmm. But I always love the fact that someone can just walk in mm -hmm. and if they interest me, I will take them out. Yeah. Now, you are famous for creating dance art, I'd like to call it, that is very difficult to put into words. Mm. Um, how does that creative process start into creating that kind of artistry? Because, I mean, for the audience to not 
quite have the words to describe it. I'm sure it's even difficult for you as the creator to yeah. start off with words. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, most of it of this work starts, you know, with a dream um, or literally just um, reflecting on the past mm -hmm. and also reacting to the immediate circumstances, mm -hmm. the issues that we are battling with as a country in the world, the mm -hmm. issues of war, the issues of displacement. These are the things, the themes that are always coming through into my work. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in, in what lies in that binary between possibility and contradiction. Mm -hmm. And the contradiction creates the possibility for mm -hmm. something beautiful to image. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's where my art is at. Mm -hmm. You know, looking at all the disadvantages, those stories that are painful and create a possibility for something beautiful mm -hmm. to emerge from that. Now, something that I've always wanted to know about choreography, especially when it comes to larger groups of dancers, um, you often see movement where it seems like organized chaos, where people scatter around but then find their place. Yeah. How do you do that as a choreographer? Do you see that movement in your head and then do you show your dancers each dancer where they're going to stand or do you kind of just let them play and find their way? How does that work? Sure. I mean, again, it's, 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 it takes a lot of elements mm. for that to happen. Firstly, is the trust I have for the dancers I work with. And then secondly, is that I write incomplete sentences. Mm. And I want the dancer to complete the sentence because you are also giving them the life. They also feel present in the work, that they don't just become you know, subjective to the work, but they mm. also have to be objective to the work. So they own it, their own mm. part of it, in a sense. Mm. So it's the vision is to allow that dialogue to continue with the body and the mind. Mm. so that they stay present in the work. What do you think has been the most special gift that has come out of this life of dance that you've created? Sure, I mean, I think this weekend is symbolism of that, mm -hmm. um, that there is um, honesty and humbleness that is always um, a defining truth mm. of the life I've lived mm. in and my contribution to dance. I think everyone who's on stage with me is synonymous to the principles that I've always mm. lived with. That dance can be a leading a form that mm. unites all of us. Born in 1973 in Soweto, Greg found respite in dance in the late 80s when political tensions pervaded his world. Respite turned to enjoyment and enjoyment to obsession, which steered him to a life of amazement and manifested dreams. Your, some of your productions have been around for some time and you've, um, you know, they've, they've made reoccurrences. Do you make any changes when they do reoccur or do you keep them as is? How, is, how does that work? I'll be very bored if I, <laughs> if I were to present the work as it was done 20 years ago, because mm. no life, if evolves mm -hmm. as, as much as our stories evolve, histories mm -hmm. evolve, cultures evolve. Um, and if I have an opportunity to revisit the work, I amplify the message, mm -hmm. either by adding bodies or just extending the language mm -hmm. of it. I'm sure um, for somebody that was exposed to dance as young as you were, um, representation was a huge key element for you because yeah. especially for people with your kind of background, people don't get to even dream of being in that kind of space. Yeah. So what does representation mean to you and what have you done to try to involve that representation for others who don't have that kind of dream even in their mind? Sure, I mean, representation is everything. Mm. Um, I grew up, I had an opportunity to be in a company that was started by a Jewish woman mm. who was kind enough to open up a space for black artists to come through. Mm. Uh, but I wanted a space where we can be able to create our own narrative mm. and not have to conform to anyone's mm. um, um, imagination but let's create our own. Hence, Vianne Dance Theatre was created. And when Vianne Dance was created, it was also to create a space for every child from every corner of Southern Africa to walk into the space with their dreams, with their story, and see them manifest into something that mm. uh, can change their lives. Mm. But representation is quite broad. 
you know, I sometimes uh, work with um, people with disability, for instance, Musa Mota is a great example mm -hmm. of that, where he walked in to audition mm -hmm. and he was given a chance like everybody else. Mm, that's amazing. And I have to say hats off with Musa and hats off to Musa for the amazing work that he's also done with you. Yeah. Um, when you create your productions, do you have a specific intention in mind or do you just create and go with the flow and then see that intention sort of come to life after when the audience reacts? Sure. Uh, there's always an intention. Well, the, the, the most of my intention is to create hope. Mm -hmm. um, I want an audience to walk away from a production with a sense of hope, mm -hmm. a sense of belonging, a sense of being inspired by the story in itself. Mm -hmm. And if it does change their life, for, for, then, then is we have achieved mm -hmm. something um, really magnificent. So and and that's been the case with many audiences who come back to me and they say that was a life changing experience mm -hmm. and I think we create work for that. Yeah, and we spoke to Hamilton um, Lamini when we it was uh, the head and the load was at the Joburg Theatre yes. earlier this year. Um, we didn't catch you. We were hoping to catch you as well, <laughs> um, but he had some amazing things to say about. Uh, working with William Kendridge. Yeah. So we wanted to find out what your experience was like and that collaboration, what inspired it, how you got into that production. Sure. Um, Mr. Kendridge is a visionary mm. and um, a visionary that is so open to a process for us to find our own interpretation of his vision. Mm -hmm. So that was really something I learned um, from him that you, you, you don't hold on to the vision to yourself, but you open it up for other visionaries in the room to extend that vision. So that has been incredible mm -hmm. um, to, to be part of that work, which was questioning you know, the existence and the participation of uh, black soldiers, African soldiers in World War I. Mm -hmm. Um, questions I'm battling with myself is like, um, you know, the black body, how is it being represented, but also more importantly, how is it being documented? Mm. What you're saying about your work with William Kendridge uh, sounds a lot like they, I'm drawing some similarities in terms of what you create um, personally and, and um, uh, independently. So how does the process of finding people to collaborate with go with you? Um, what are the characteristics that you need in yeah. a collaborator that will, will work well with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a big collaborator. Mm. Um, I wouldn't achieve half of what I've achieved if it wasn't true collaboration um, with designers, with set designers, with fashion designers with composers, dancers, so collaboration is key. And I choose people out of my own curiosity of their own work. If I'm curious enough about the work that you're creating, I'm curious enough for me to be in the space with you to dig deeper into your thinking process. So it allows me to tap into your mind uh, and by doing that, I'm also opening up a possibility for something else to emerge that I wouldn't have thought about. And you've also performed in many different countries with your work. What have been the, your key findings or the most interesting elements that you've picked up with regards to the different reactions from different audiences? I mean, here yeah, mm. we're able to relate to some of the, to, of the content. Mm. So what have been the biggest differences? Sure. I think... Maybe the, 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 I will rephrase the question is like, what is that is common mm -hmm. that we're finding is the sense that um, there is humility in the work and it requires humanity in order for it to aspire into something greater. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes across every audiences that we've been through, whether we go to, to France or in the continent, in mm -hmm. every part of the continent. But the difference is that the Western audience has been taught to sit back and watch. So there's always a third wall. While in the African context, it's a shared space. Mm -hmm. It's between me, we are in conversation, mm -hmm. we are Congressing, we are in we are in a, in a church, 
between me and an audience. So there's a call and response all the time. Mm. And that is magnificent to see. Just last week at a Baxter Theatre, after I've performed, the audiences stood up, they clapped, but they erupted into a song. Mm. And you can't find that anywhere else oh. except in this country. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Some creators create to educate or inform, and others create to question. And you also mentioned earlier that you, you tried to, um, your, your purpose is to give hope. Mm. Um, so between informing and questioning, where do you think your work fits in and where, what do you think is most important? It's very balanced, you mm. know, as much as, as I'm educating, I'm also questioning. Um, I think we've got to give more questions. Mm. We've got to be able to raise um, sometimes uncomfortable questions mm. to ourselves, but to others that we want to change their perception about something else. Mm. Um, so I raise questions and I give answers. Mm. And that has been the principle of my work. As much as I'm educating, I say to, to my people, to those that are mentor, um, let's ask the questions mm -hmm. let's ask the the, the right questions because sometimes dance can be seen as a euphoria of movement mm -hmm. that it is the beauty of it that erases the truth of mm -hmm. it so and i focus on the truth now you mentioned in, a, in another interview that um turning 50 has meant maturity for you mm. um some people might say that no matter how old you get, um, there's still a certain element within yourself that just feels like you're still a, a child. Mm. <laughs> so in what way do you feel like you still are able to infuse those little childlike elements in your yeah. work? Yeah, and I think, you know, growing up, approaching 50, well, yeah, in two days, three days, four days, I'll be 50. <laughs> and I approach it like Mickey Mouse. Mm. You know, um, I, I tend to take out the Mickey out of me because that is life. It mm -hmm. gives me joy to be able to enjoy even the difficult moments, mm -hmm. to enjoy the process of putting together a work. Mm -hmm. And finding that at my age has really liberated how I'm going to create mm -hmm. work in the future. And, and that is amazing. Mm -hmm. And the entertainment industry, but more specifically the, in the dance world, age is such a, I won't say a taboo, but it's very um, closely policed in the mm. dance world. And I've heard time and time again that the lifespan of a dancer is short. And yet here you are a few days away from 50, still yeah. on the stage. Sure, you're making your way out, but you're still very much involved. Yeah. How have you um, dispelled that idea that you can only dance until this very short um, age or this very young age, right? Sure. I mean, I think many people have dispelled that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, one example is Jermaine Courtney, Mama Jermaine from Senegal. She's dispelled that myth uh, I mean, many years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we call her Mama Jermaine because she's been incredible as an inspiration in the continent in terms mm -hmm. of dance. Uh, but we've got also, you know, someone like Martha Graham who danced to her. 90s mm. um, and she, when she passed on she was still dancing mm. so that myth has been erased many many years before but I go to the rural Bumalanga I go to the rural uh, um, in the Eastern Cape you still find our grandmothers dancing mm. so True. you can dance for as long as the heart is willing mm. you can still dance you've been known to address um, stereotypes in your work. What current existing stereotypes that when you come into contact with just raise your blood temperature? <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, it's, it's a kind of like, a, 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 it contradicts, you know, a lot of stuff that um, I've always been fighting for. Mm. Um, but one of the things that really kind of like gets under my skin is the fact that when we talk about um, women liberation and um, the struggle that women go through, mm. we talk about them from a point of privilege. Mm. And I want to see that narrative being changed into a point where we're celebrating the achievement than us having to create from 
all the hardship, mm. all the, you know, the issues that are affecting women and children mm. in this country. I want to create, I want to get to a space where we're creating to, to, to celebrate, to inspire, mm. and not to caution. Mm. And that for me is always something, if I see your work, that always cautions us mm -hmm. about them, like, we shouldn't be there mm -hmm. anymore. You know, we should celebrate mm -hmm. and uplift our women and they should be there and be celebrated. Wonderful. Um, so just touching back on the idea of maturity in your work, uh, have you ever created or can you think of a piece of work that you've created in the past where it had certain ideas as a younger version of Gregory that now at this <laughs> age you say, you know what, I don't really think the same uh, anymore. <laughs> well, you know, Kitima is one of the works that mm. I created and, and the work was created really out of my childhood memories. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a letter to my grandmother mm. and uh, a memory I lived with my grandmother and see her age and becoming a child and for me to pick up that energy of her becoming a child and how I felt that oh my god she was at peace with herself being an elder and going back and being a child that sense of innocence is something that I miss quite a lot um, so we are doing that work again just to tap into that innocence. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. We can't wait for this, for the show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for having me. With a milestone birthday looming, Makoma has been inspired to use his 50th as an opportunity for him to present a piece of him that will ultimately leave a legacy. The GM50 Legacy Weekend is an ode to Greg as a stalwart in the dance world and will feature some of his esteemed colleagues, collaborators and friends who will narrate his story of the 33 years in the creative arts industry. The Legacy Weekend also comes with the double launch of Makoma's books, Joy Dancer, a picture children's book written by Makoma and Dr. Klinam Klope, and My Life, My Dance, My Soul, the story of Gregory Makoma, which is co-written with Lorato Trock. The GM50 Legacy Weekend will be hosted at the Joburg Theatre on the 14th and 15th of October.